Hi, uh, I'm Saul Griffith. Um, historically, I did things like Squid Labs, uh, Instructables.com, Makani Power. Currently doing Other Lab, Other Machine Company, Nubotics, and some fun things. And I want to talk about what I see as a very exciting future of hardware, which is decidedly not hard or unsolid. And so, playfully, my talk is about when engineers go soft. Um, about 400 million years ago, uh, both of these two creatures that you see here started to evolve on completely different tracks. On your left is the bluefin tuna, um, which has a completely rigid skeleton and has completely rigid materials in a very high lift tail. On the right is the mako shark. There's not a rigid element except for the teeth. It's all, all based on cartilage, but again, has very high aspect ratio fins. So, Here's a completely unsolid or a soft way to solve an engineering problem and a completely rigid way. The Mako Shark is faster than the tuna. So it turns out that you can build very highly performant machines. And among the amazing things that the, the soft shark can do, it can, it, by pressurizing and depressurizing it, its skin, it can turn faster or slower. So it's like a dynamically tunable machine, which is something that the, uh, the poor tuna can't do. So in the real world, today and for a long time, um, we've always solved problems with stiffness. So you can see on the left, these are telegraph poles that have been blown over by a hurricane. On the right, we have palm trees which are surviving the same hurricane. The palm trees survive because they're soft and compliant and they can actually do load shedding, which is something that the telegraph poles can't. And biology and, and nature uses this strategy a huge amount to enormous success. Um, while I was actually preparing this talk, literally this morning, this video came into my inbox, and I think Disney might say it better than anyone else. Uh, I'll let this play. Yes! So as you can see, poor unsuspecting child wants rigid robot. Poor unsuspecting child gets soft robot. <laughs> um, this, I think, is typical of the world right now. We take soft and, and unrigid things not very seriously, but I'm hopefully with the rest of the talk to show you that we should take them very seriously. One of the great advantages of soft robots, they're very lightweight, so a human can safely interact with them. Uh, they're very compliant and springy, so they won't hurt you. The same kid fighting a rigid robot would probably get hurt. So that's the Disney version of events. This is a, a Harvard soft robot by the Whitesides group at Harvard. Um, this, I think, is really a spectacular uh, sort of vision of the future and, and the capacity of various classes of soft robots. So this is really just one single cast piece of rubber with five channels of pneumatic pressure. You can see it walk up to, with one walking gait, a glass window, completely change its shape and its morphology, so hyper-elastic, and now actually wriggle its way underneath that plate of glass, right? There, you cannot build that, you cannot do these types of tasks with rigid uh, machines. So for robotic earthworms, all of these types of applications, you can see the utility of soft quite clearly. So, who do we have responsible for what went wrong in engineering? Uh, it's this guy, Robert Hooke. So in 1660, he came out with something called Hooke's Law, uh, F equals KX, which was linearly approximating uh, all materials as springs and machines as, as linear things. Now, in you know, pre-calculus days, this was hugely useful. It meant we could make the math for engineering structures work out on paper, but it trapped us down a pathway of rigid. I'm going to now show you three slides and tell a small white lie with them. So these are stress-strain curves. 
uh, every single material has some curve on this plot of the relationship of, of stress, the load, to the strain, how it deforms. And because of F equals KX and Robert Hooke, we really only use materials up to that little arrow there, the proportional limit. We only use that bit, and we're very conservative with materials. There are analogous charts for machines where we're also very conservative with machines. And that's because up until now we've been scared of this bit because this is nonlinear, this is weird, this requires a whole lot of physics to make machines work. So I think we now, because of computation, because of sensing, because of a whole bunch of things, can readdress this, and we're already starting to see examples. So the old school way, the solid way to solve a crash problem is add more and more and more mass and material, which is adding more and more and more cost. The unsolid way is the smart way. So you use some sensing um, to, comp to, to then deploy something just when it's needed. So the same way the palm tree, just when it's needed, sheds the wind load, uh, the, the airbags, just when they're needed, explode, and they are soft and compliant and play nicely with you know, our squishy, fatty human bodies. Other examples that are maybe more playful, but I think we're going to see increasing numbers of these, you can now buy a Nerf gun, the one on the right, the soft one. It has, it's one piece, one single molded piece. The gun on the left is probably 20 injection molded pieces. These both shoot the same little things about the same distance, uh, but there's a huge reduced complexity to the type of machine on the right, just by using compliance, uh, which gives you manufacturing costs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this is another sort of fun example. You can use glass to make it heavy and expensive uh, vase, or you can use two films of plastic and do achieve, the, achieve the same effect. So you'll see a recurring theme here is that we, by using compliance and using materials optimally loaded where they need to be, you can make very lightweight machines. That means they're going to be more environmentally friendly, uh, faster, etc. So. I found a company called Makani Power that uh, you probably saw their, their fantastic wing out there. This is an interesting example of the, let's call it the unsolid movement. So traditional wind turbine tries to survive you know, strong winds by being loaded in bending. So it's, being, it's always being pushed over and you have to add more and more steel to deal with that. With Makani, you're a compliant in two of the axes uh, of the rope and then just stiff in the one of the rope. So, what this enables you to do, uh, and I'll, I'll set the video playing in case people haven't seen this because I think it's spectacular. Um, we have literally, by using a control, you know, why do you have that big, that big tower in a normal system? It's to keep the, the wings from hitting the ground. So if you can make a control system, sort of a UAV, to keep the wing from hitting the ground, you eliminate all the weight, all the cost of that tower and so we're doing it by a combination of controls enabled by using compliant materials, namely a tether. So here we are uh, launching this craft from its, or this is a completely autonomous test, so launching it autonomously from a cradle flying up in a sort of uh, quadcopter type mode to the top of the sky. From there, it will actually transition into a rotating flight. Here we go, this is the onboard view. This is doing uh, enough Gs that a human pilot would black out in a couple of seconds. I have 24 hours of video of it doing this, so I'm now going to stop my talk and let you watch that. Um, it is actually mesmerizing to see this thing flying autonomous circles. But you literally get about a 90% weight reduction in your piece of machine to perform the same action, and that weight reduction corresponds to a huge cost reduction. So we are experimenting with things like unsolid helmets at other lab. Uh, you can actually tune the deceleration profile. These things are, are nice and compliant, so you, it looks like you'll get a higher performant helmet at lighter weight using soft inflated structures. Um, you know, this is a neighborhood electric vehicle, the rigid version on the left. This is our soft version. Um, I didn't necessarily stand up here to be taken seriously today, so you'll see a lot of these funny things. Uh, so that is it. It's also, you steer it with your butt. It has no steering wheel. Um, so it, it gives you the appearance of mind control, but it's very subtle movements of the hips that actually do the steering here. Uh, that's the engineer with his game face on. Um, you can see how much fun this thing is. This is genuine. Uh, maybe to skip through to the end of this, 
So why is this interesting? Oh. Wait, here we go, yep. This is what you can do with a soft car um, over and over. <laughs> uh, which is a very, you know, I'm very serious that again, you get similar crash worthiness at much lower weights and perhaps even better than that. So this is basically an, a wearable inflatable airbag roll cage. So then we started to try rolling it. Um, unfortunately, I don't have video of it, but we now are good enough at this roll to roll over 360, land sunny side up, and keep driving. Um, please do not notice that he is neither wearing shoes nor a helmet, nor that that's oncoming traffic. That's, uh, <laughs> that's Tucker Gilman, um, who runs our, one of our uh, great projects at our lab. Um, so this is a project, uh, Layla Madrone and Jim McRide are working hard on this. On the left, you see a traditional rigid two-axis uh, heliostat for solar energy tracking. On the right, uh, at Other Lab, we are replacing this with quite literally four PET uh, soda bottles. So this is the very first um, successful demo of this. So the thing on the left there is actually a three liter soda bottle. They injection mold the preform and then they put that into a mold and they blow that out. And in the process of blowing it, they increase the strength of the PET about tenfold by molecular alignment and they normally blow it into the shape of you know, a Coke bottle or a milk bottle or something. Magic of video, this process uh, just happens. We now put four of these together and this thing will, uh, running open loop, steer in two axes to about one degree pointing accuracy and closed loop, we can do 0.1 degree pointing accuracy. It is compliant, again, similar to Makani, it's compliant in two of the three axes. It's very stiff and can support a huge amount of load in the one axis that counts, which rejects the wind load. Um, and you can see it there working. The more beautiful implementation is obviously this. Um, this is actually moving astonishingly fast. It really only has to move once a day. So again, this removes about 80 to 90% of the mass of a traditional system. We did away with two gearboxes. We removed two servo motors. Uh, we removed all of the copper in the system and we replaced it with four Coke bottles. So you can imagine once again, the cost reductions by thinking about this new way of doing engineering. So, the, you know, the really big themes that I'd like to emphasize, because we need more people to join the club, so to speak, is the importance of being able to substitute a control system or, you know, a, a sensors and, and uh, computers for actual materials. So, Neil Gershenfeld's down here. We are actually now replacing atoms with bits, which is sort of an extension of the, the bits and atoms story. Um, so compliance also, like the, like the palm tree in the, middle, in the middle, by building compliance systems, we can handle all of the unusual loads of the world. Traditionally, when you design something like that heliostat, you imagine what the worst load it will ever see in its lifetime is, and you design for that load by adding metal and adding concrete and adding weight. But if you are compliant, to all of the unusual loads, then you can absorb the once in a hundred year windstorm, you can absorb the load of your telephone being dropped on the ground or running into a telegraph pole in your uh, inflatable car, but you don't have to carry all of that weight and cost for your whole life. So hugely important, very big theme, I think, in the future of engineering. Um, this is my six year old niece, Emily. Uh, she got me into this mess. Uh, we were trying to make we were trying to convince the Department of Energy to fund the solar work you saw, and they had rejected us. But for Christmas, I gave her the elephant you see here on the left. Um, she said, Uncle Saul, after Christmas, she'd played with it for a month. Um, that's cool and all, but can you make it walk? Uh, so this is the very first uh, inflatable robot as we build it. Um, this is, we first built a simulation, because um, there are no CAD tools or design tools for soft objects, so we built our own. This is the very first proof of the muscle concept. And here is our elephant at the blistering speed of one mile every eight hours, um, which incidentally was the design spec of my six-year-old niece, because that's the appropriate speed to go to school if you live a mile away, obviously. Um, so from there, uh, they got more serious. And again, you know, I think there's, there's going to be there's going to be a tuna and a mako shark for every type of machine. 
So Big Dog is a tuner. Big Dog weighs about 800 pounds, has, can lift about 400 pounds. On the right, this is our robot we call the ant roach because it's half anteater, half cockroach. There's two possible names for that, one of which is ant roach. Um, it weighs about 70 pounds. If you don't get that joke, come and see me later. Um, this robot weighs about 70 pounds. It can lift uh, up to 1,000 pounds. It can walk with many hundreds. So these are robots that can, uh, that can lift many times their weight. This is my completely spoiled rotten son who doesn't understand that the average two-year-old doesn't get to ride on an inflatable robot every day. And oh, I love it just there. This is the, oh my god, dad, you've blown my mind <laughs> face right there. He's only wearing a helmet because I know his grandfather is sitting in the front row over there. Um, so this is uh, sort of the next step for this guy was this, so showing proportional control of the nose. This, this robot's about five feet high at the shoulder. It's about 15 feet long. can walk now at two or three miles per hour, or it, it could until four people dancing on it at our Christmas party exploded it. Um, true story, sadly. Uh, so the future will be cuddly robots. Um, we are doing a huge amount of work on this right now. So on the left, this is a uh, Raytheon Sarkos uh, exoskeleton. Um, weighs many hundreds of pounds, traditional electromechanical system. We are really looking at building exodermises, so second skins, and we have a, a, a startup effort in this space. Um, to give you a sense of these things, again, when you want to interface with the body, it's very hard, as you can see in that previous picture, to interface a rigid machine with our, fleshy, our fleshiness, and it's particularly our joints, which are both rotation and translation, which is a difficult thing to build into a mechanism. This is a completely compliant actuator made out of ballistic nylon, so cheap backpack material. This is inflated to 20 PSI. It has a virtual center of rotation, so you can put it around the joints of the human body, and it's compliant enough to deal with the rotations and the translations of the human body. Uh, here it is, actually, on an arm with Tim Swift, who's now running this project, uh, uh, who came to us from Exobionics. Here we are actuating that arm. At about 20 PSI, this arm will add a quarter to a half of your strength in addition to what you're doing. Uh, at 100 PSI, which is the design pressure, this thing will enable you basically to do one-arm pull-ups without breaking a sweat. So we're looking at incredible medical device applications, extreme sport applications, um, Iron Man, well, not Iron Man applications. Uh, here's Kevin Albert, a uh, fabulous engineer, is running our robotics program. So shows you he does all of his curls without the device. He can do, I think, 14. He then waits 10 minutes, which isn't even the full recovery time, does it with the device, uh, and then you can see he does 23. So um, even at way below the design spec, this is already uh, increasing human endurance and muscular endurance. This, by the way, that whole arm weighs one pound. A traditional arm exoskeleton weighs about 12 to 16 pounds. So that, that extreme strength to weight ratio is a huge advantage of these soft and compliant machines. Uh, maybe you guys saw this, but you know, the solid version is on the left. The more interesting toy is the one on the right. And uh, for those people who haven't seen this, we built life-size Rock'em Sock'em robots. We gave them to drunken Google engineers to play with. Um, this is what they did. And here's the, the killer blow. Yeah. So they're just like the originals, the heads pop off. Um, there's not a single rigid application where I don't think these things have an application. We're now looking very in detail at this application. So completely compliant, all membrane-based, seawater-filled robots that are at basically infinite-depth submarines. So they'll be very highly performant, more efficient, and more capable than their rigid counterparts. And we're doing, uh, we have Newbotics, which is the spin-out of other lab run by Kevin Albert that is focusing on building arms uh, from... Oh, Just to give you, here you go, one of the senses of why these are really interesting. Uh, this is our intern um, who never smiled through the entire summer except for this one experiment. So here he is playing with this thing. Uh, now, yep, here we go. 
So you get to the interesting thing. So you can make incre incredibly fault tolerant robots to the point of being able to have, wait a second, the one smile of the intern summer is, there it is. <laughs> Game face on. Uh, so that looks pretty springy and pretty weird. Um, where we are up to now is we have complete closed loop uh, control implemented on these things. Um, we're doing full, you know, and this is the power of computation sensing now, we are doing full predictive uh, physics model of the gas dynamics in real time to, uh, in the control loop. So we can now control this arm, which weighs about five or six pounds, uh, to within a millimeter, you know, well, sub-centimeter, we should be able to get to about a millimeter in accuracy and repeatability over two meter volume. Um, it has a 300 millisecond swing time from one side to the other. That's as fast as a human and, a, and way faster than a traditional robot. Uh, and it's about 50 to 100 times lighter weight than the equivalent rigid industrial robot. So with that, I'll leave you with a couple of pictures of the future. Um, because of our unstructured environments, the compliance enables you to naturally do things like pick up cups. Uh, and certainly if we really want this vision of robots that work very closely with human, or as we say in the robotics company, you know, you want cage-free, cage free-range Californian robots, I think we're the only game in town. Thanks, everyone.